It's the 23rd of January 2019 and I'm here with um, Rod Slater. Uh, Rod uh, retired in 2008 from George Watson's College after 25 years on the staff here. Uh, most of that time you were Head of Department of the Modern Languages Department. But as we'll see today, there's much more to, to Rod than just 25 years in Collington Road. Rod, you had an interesting childhood background. Do you want to tell us something a wee bit about that before we start? Um, well, I was born in Scotland, but almost just by chance, because my father, who's in the army, uh, had been in India until a month or two before we were born. I say we, I have a twin sister. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but with the troubles in 1947, he and my mother decided to come back and he rejoined his Scottish regiment, the Gordon Highlanders. So uh, we were born in Nairn, mm -hmm. but at the age of three months or so, I think, uh, went to Germany and lived there for three or four years. And then after Germany, Nigeria for another three or four years. So it wasn't until we were about eight that we lived in the UK. And do you remember much about your first primary education in Africa? Oh yes, yes. It was a University of Ibadan, at that time, University of Ibadan Primary School. Mm -hmm. And it was quite unusual because there were quite, it was a mixed school. The, the sort of emerging African middle class university lecturers and so on sent their kids there too. So, mm -hmm. so it was quite an unusual school there. Right. And from and there to? After that, we were briefly in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. and I, I went to Collington Primary School um, in Thorburn Road. Mm -hmm. It then became part of Benali and is now an old folks' home. Mm -hmm. But um, we went there because we lived in army quarters in Redford mm -hmm. for 18 months. But during all that time, all the men in the uh, battalion were out in Cyprus. There was the um, insurrection out there and they had to go off to Cyprus very suddenly and all the families were left here in Edinburgh for 18 months. Yeah. So Nigeria and then Edinburgh and where did you finish off your school education? Well after Edinburgh we went to Schoon. Uh, right. I fin finished primary education in Schoon and I was about to go to Perth Academy but my mm -hmm. parents moved to Aberdeen and they thought they'd be continue moving and I'd had quite a disrupted uh, education so they sent me to Strathallan. So I was, was six and a half years as a boarder at Strathallan. And was that an enjoyable experience? Well, um, yeah, yes. I mean there were, there were lots of good things and some, some excellent things ab about it. But um, I did miss home a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I took part in all the activities and so on. But uh, I never had any sort of adolescent revolt against my parents because when I got home I was just so happy to be home <laughs> and so on, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but no, there were many, many good things, Ex some, some excellent teaching, uh, mm. yeah. Good. And your travels continued after Strathall and you went south for tertiary education. Tell us a wee bit about that. Well, yeah, before, before I, uh, when I left school it was in December because you had to stay on to sit Cambridge entrance exams. And then um, through the influence of one of my teachers at Strath, uh, Richard Studholm, with whom I'm still in contact, um, I went as a pupil to a school in La Rochelle for eight months, from the January until the August. Uh, and it was the boys' school and I, I, was, I had a status that was called auditeur libre, or a free listener, and it was more free than listening. <laughs> I, did, I, went to, I went to some classes, but not all, uh, but got to know a lot of people and so on. And during that time, got to know my future wife, who was at the girls' school. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then after that, I went to Cambridge for three years, uh, did a degree in modern languages, French and German. Modern and medieval languages was the official term, but, mm -hmm. but more modern. And then after that, because it wasn't possible at Cambridge to go abroad, uh, I went to Germany as an assistant for a year. And I'd intended to become a journalist, but I wanted some experience in 
uh, in, a, uh, in Germany uh, and being an assistant was an, a nice easy sort of option but when I got there I loved the school so much and I loved teaching so much that I, I changed orientation and decided to become a teacher. So it was all down to that excellent school in Germany. Mm. Yeah. Ah, there we go, so that's a complete yeah. change of course you weren't really expecting at, yeah. the, at the time. So you did your teacher training in Cambridge? Yes, then. yes. I applied to Murray House mm -hmm. but um, th because I'd studied in Cambridge they, w w they wouldn't accept me mm. at that time. Right. Uh, so I stayed on in Cambridge mm -hmm. and then got a job um, it was very easy to find jobs in those days, um, and, but I, I got a job in a comprehensive in Huntingdon, St Peter's School Huntingdon, which had just gone comprehensive. It had been a secondary modern, so like a junior secondary. And at that time, um, the early 70s, you know, I was full of sort of left-wing idealism and the whole, the whole idea of comprehensive education and I would never ever finish up in a, prime, in a private school and so on. So I thought, um, you know, I'd go to what was a pretty rough comprehensive. And there were a few of us in the same situation, all starting at the same time. And that was brilliant because we could, we were so engaged, we did so many things and we learned so much and it was hard. <laughs> we, but we got the feeling we were bringing to, the, to these kids something they didn't have anyway. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was very, very good. But after two or, uh, th four years there, Sylvie and I went across to France on an exchange and we finished up in the Auvergne, which is very, very like Scotland. And during that time, because French teachers don't work as hard as British ones. We had a one and a half days during the week that are free, plus the weekends. And we did a huge amount of walking and cross-country skiing and cycling and, and so on. We were outside all the time. And the thought of coming back to Cambridge, which was just so flat, you know, because I was in Huntingdon, but we lived in Cambridge, uh, which was just so flat, made us start to look for jobs elsewhere and applied for various jobs in Scotland and one came up in West Calder. Uh, one was in Stranraer, which I got, but I'm really glad I didn't accept it, <laughs> and finished up at West Calder High School, which was a very good, normal, comprehensive in West Lothian, and had six happy years there, mm -hmm. but began to feel a little bit unsettled towards the end of the time. Um, especially as I'd started to do work for the SQA uh, by going around other schools and, and speaking to um, advanced higher pupils um, and seeing that outside in other schools there was a lot going on that there wasn't in West Calder and I thought oh there are all these bright kids out there and I'm not seeing any of them mm. and so the job came up at Watson's and I applied for it mm. but half-heartedly and when I was offered it I initially thought no I'm not uh, this is a betrayal of everything I've done up to now <laughs> so but Roger Young was very patient he said look if you applied for the job deep down you wanted it so take two days and then ring me back and during that after that time I said okay I'll come <laughs> yeah so the young socialist arises yeah. at Watson's. Oh, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> Suddenly. Uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. different. And, and Watson's, I guess, is a very different place then than it was when you left. So what were your first impressions of the school? Or? Um, well, I'd been brought up in private education, so it wasn't such a big shock. Um, I, I, I felt instantly at home, actually, to tell the truth, because I felt there was a sort of level of, of energy and um, s spontaneity around the place. It was not, uh, chaotic's not the word, but there was a sort of certain raffishness about Watson's, <laughs> you know, the, but, but a, a creativity that, that, that was there. Um, the pupils were very much more questioning than later mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. You know there were there were there were really lively debates. Um, there was Eki. There was the sixth form 
uh, review. So people were, a certain sort of pupil were, was allowed to be critical of the school in an affectionate way and I, I enjoyed that very much. Yeah. Rod, one of your big involvements in school has been in projects, S3 projects. How did you get involved in that and where did you go? Tell us a bit about your experience. Um, well, to begin with, uh, for the first two years I didn't go on projects. I was on exchanges to Tonon les Bains and to, uh, to Munich. And, uh, but I was very involved in the hill walking club right from the start. You do three or four times a term we'd go out with a couple of minibuses up to the Perthshire Hills. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was involved in going out into the hills right from the start, but it was in my third year at Watson's that I first went on projects and I went to the lakes with Harry Quinn and um, Graham McVitie. And that was a great introduction <laughs> to two wonderful characters. <laughs> and um, then the following year I went to Torridon with Pat Edington, biology Pat. Um, and he knew Torridon very well. He'd been there right from the start. And he gave me so much guidance about what to see and how to handle the kids and so on. <laughs> Um, and the kids knew how to handle him because he, he was a, a very strong walker. When you looked at him, he seemed to be going slowly, but in fact, he never stopped, you know, just mm -hmm. one step in front of the other. <laughs> and sometimes the kids, knowing that he was a very keen biologist, would um, say, what's this plant, sir? Or is, is that a fox dropping? And so on. And he'd give them a long lecture and they wouldn't listen, but they'd just <sighs> get their <laughs> breath back. Mm -hmm. but, and Pat always advised, if you're going back to the same place, go to some of the same mountains, but always discover a new one, at least one new one every year. And I did that in all the 10 years I went to Torridon. So that was my, my f f introduction. So I went to Torridon quite a few times, and then also to the, to the Hebrides. Uh, to, um, we always stayed in Harris, North Uist once briefly, but, and explored, Harris and Lewis and I was really pleased to do that. My mother had come from Lewis so I felt at, at home up there mm -hmm. and often would go and visit relatives and so on but but I loved that and it was at, during the Harris years that I saw the biggest change in projects because at the beginning it was very much a question of uh, climb a hill a day and a rest day was a lower hill but over the years, other activities have come in, um, sometimes with instructors. In fact, most often with instructors, I think. You, you can say a lot more about projects <laughs> you, uh, with, with your involvement in them. But it, to begin with, you know, I thought, oh, you know, what, what are we doing um, by going canoeing? We should be climbing and so on. But I, I soon changed that because I saw that if the kids were exposed to a whole range of outdoor activities, then that was very beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that I, I, I approve of that because they come back with a wider experience and also with the involvement in the John Muir Trust, a sort of environmental awareness as well. So I, I, I really approve of all that now. When I joined the staff, you told me that uh, Watson's was a wonderful place, but uh, the two weeks of projects were the best two weeks of the session. Is that something you'd still tell new staff? Yes, it, I, I would, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember sitting on a hillside with Harry Quinn in that first year and sort of just looking out over the lakes and he identified all the tops and everything. And he said, hey, to think they're paying us for this, mate. <laughs> I always thought back of Harry and, and that. But it is in, in a selfish way because you know, I really loved being out with the kids in the hills and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I loved exchanges, I really did. But projects have the edge on that. Mm -hmm. And I look back on those years of projects with just great happiness. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to school sport uh, for a moment, in particular rugby. Uh, you obviously played at school and uh, you've been a good supporter of um, rugby, both um, school and internationally. You're, 
And tell us a wee bit about that, a wee bit about um, how you get involved in translating for the, the SRU. Um, I, yeah, I played rugby at school, but, but not to a very high level. I, I was in, never quite made it to the first uh, at Strath. I was, um, I was captain of the seconds, <laughs> just plodded on. Uh, and then at university, I didn't play rugby, I rode. Um, there and so at the beginning at, at Watson's for the first few years I was in charge of the rowing club um, though I didn't I wasn't wholeheartedly in charge of them uh, because it, it just took up every single weekend uh, but then I got involved with, with it, it, when Ian Brown was in charge of the Scottish schoolboys rugby union he asked me along once when the French were coming to do some translating there and um, I did that for two or three years, um, well, every second year, you know. For, and then um, the, the grown-up union <laughs> asked me if I would go along and do some translating for them. Um, so I would go along to some of the dinners beforehand and the post-match um, conferences with the, with the with the TV on you and everything like that, and then to, to some of the social functions afterwards. So I, I did that for, I think maybe eight, eight or ten years. Yeah. And until finally, one day when when translating for the French um, coach Bernard Laporte, who wouldn't stop, I asked him if he would just do it in little chunks, and he did a whole long speech, and I, I just got lost and panicked. But luckily, um, someone came in and helped me. But I still have nightmares about being in front of all the TV cameras and not knowing what to say, <laughs> like now. Yeah. <laughs> and most recently, you translated for the inaugural Milroy Cup. Yes. Uh, that was quite a special occasion. Yes, yes. That, that I was. Um, we were in, involved. Well, the school were involved in that, and they brought me in to help to translate that. And that that, that, that was the first. Cup for the French France Scotland match and so on. So I, yes, I'm so involved in the translation of that too. Yeah. Great. And of course, all your translation work was relatively easy because you're fluent in French and German. That takes us back to the department that you're in. That was a huge department. It wasn't just two languages, was it? No, there, there were the, just as there are at present. Um, th th there were French. There was French German. Italian, Spanish, ooh, and one other, which I've forgotten, yeah. Chinese, uh, and Russian. Yeah, that was it, Russian. Ch Chinese came in later and is, is now very important. F French was the main language by far, the others were very much subsidiaries, but I think they've come up now, uh, mm -hmm. maybe not to equal status with French, but, but certainly um, a lot more important than they used to be. A big department, I think there were 16 or 17 of us, plus the assistants, so that was into the low 20s. Um, of, of course there were other posts of responsibility in the department, uh, you know, people in, front, in, in charge specifically of German or Spanish um, uh, or Russian, but uh, I found it maybe, you know, it, it was there wasn't any secretarial help or anything like that. And we as heads of department still had to do our full whack as uh, form teachers and everything like that. You know, we, we weren't kept from that. So um, it was, it's quite daunting in a way, but um, I, I enjoyed it. There was, there was a very good team there. Maybe later on, in the mid 90s or so, late 90s, maybe I was so involved in other aspects of the school, in putting on plays and uh, uh, projects and exchanges and so on, that sports, that I felt the department was just one of these many activities and perhaps I should have considered it to be the main thing, after all that's what I was being paid for. And um, I think looking back, I should perhaps have cut back on one or two other things and concentrated a little bit more on my colleagues in the department who sometimes felt that 
they might not have been top of my priority, <laughs> or certainly in terms of urgency. Yeah. yeah. Given that, though, the ethos of the school has always been that people are involved in a number of things yeah, out with yeah. the classroom. Yeah. So you certainly fulfilled um, that, and uh, that that just didn't stop when the bell went at four o'clock because. One of the things that I, I, I know you're famous for is your hospitality that Sylvia and you have given to students and GAP students over the years. How did that start, particularly with GAP students who weren't language assistants? Well, when I was an assistant myself in Germany, I was really well looked after. Um, people found accommodation for me and they invited me right through the year and so on. And so when I started teaching, I did the same with the assistants in the different schools I, I taught in. And that continued at Watson. So it was mainly the language assistants. And then that included, as we went on, the, the Hamilton, uh, the visiting Hamilton fellows. And the, the GAP students. The GAP students I, I began to take responsibility for after I stepped down from being head of department because in 2001 I had a heart attack on a Monday morning in, in school. school. <laughs> yes. Oh gosh. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember going up to matrons, you know, I, um, which was up a flight of steps and along and she wasn't there and in that bleak corridor behind the stage I kept thinking, oh my gosh, I just don't want to have a, a full-blown heart attack here. But I made it to the front of the school where Matron was. And, mm. But um, after that heart attack, I had just two months off, actually. It wasn't longer than that. I came back. That was in the March, and I came back in the May. But having decided to continue, but to take things a lot easier. But during the course of that following year, I realised you, you couldn't slow down at Watson's. <laughs> um, with all those commitments. And so Gareth Edwards, whose first year it was, and I decided that I would step aside from being head of department. Mm. And I was quite happy to do that. Um, but I took on other responsibilities, mainly specifically all the, all the exchanges in, in school and all the gap year students, amongst other things, and the Hamilton Fellowship. And uh, so we, we saw it, Sylvie and I just saw it as part of our that remit to to invite the young ones and keep a sort of fatherly eye on them. So dozens of students have passed through your, your door and been given wonderful hospitality in Craig Locker. Are you still in touch with some of them? Yes, quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. We see, we see them. They they come back. Uh, we see them abroad and so on. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Great. So that. That's very good. Now. When you left the school in 2008, I, I suppose many people might have thought that was the end of your involvement, but in, in many ways it's the beginning of a wider involvement in the school. So what happened then? Well, immediately after I left school, I was, um, I, I found I, I really missed the, the activity and the buzz of things and so on. Uh, maybe not doing... The, the marking, <laughs> so that's one aspect I, I quite happily uh, did without. But um, I was asked by St George's if I'd go and do some supply work for them um, for two weeks and f the, f there was a colleague who was ill and she was iller than thought to begin with so I spent six months there. Mm. and but. Uh, and, but she, she recovered fully and is still, still going, going strong. But during those six months, it was like a sort of stepping down into retirement for me because it wasn't the full-on Watson's commitment, but I was actually teaching and doing full load of teaching and, and marking and parents' evenings and so on. But in a sort of, it was like being a young teacher again, you know, it gave me a sort of energy again I felt I felt that was very good and my St George's boss the head of department there was a former pupil of mine Louise Kelly class of, nine, of uh, 96 and she said at the beginning when I arrived that, that this is going to be very awkward and I said no 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 not at all it's I'm really pleased to um, and so that sort of showed me that I wasn't ready to step down from any commitment and so I did some years where I did occasional supply at Watson's and, and so on. 
But then uh, Roy Mack asked me whether I would want to be involved in the Watsonian Club a couple of years after I retired. And so um, I said yes, not knowing anything at all about the Watsonian Club <laughs> at all. You know, it was something that we teachers weren't really involved with. But uh, Roy and the whole of the team in the development office were, were wonderful. And so I had a year as vice president and then I was president for a year. Um, looking back, they've changed it now and the president stays in office for two years and I would have preferred that because it was all such a rush and you were learning very, very fast and then suddenly you're finished. But going round the different clubs and seeing so many welcoming people who had so much good to say about the school, that was wonderful. And Sylvie enjoyed that too. You know, she, she never thought, you know, here's this French lady thinking, here I am president, uh, you know, the, the Madame Présidente, Madame Présidente of the Watsonian Club, but she just loved it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, we stayed involved ever, ever since, although of course, on, on much more on the edges of it, but it was a, a wonderful community and it gave us um, the, the opportunity to, to, to see all these people who had led such interesting lives but still had a commitment to the school. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And of course you've had two sons who have been through the school so yeah. it's just very much a sort of a continuing connection with it and you, yes. you see their friends and so on. Yes, and, yes. Yeah. Yeah. One who left in 95 and the other in 2005. Mm -hmm. Two very different characters and so on but they've they keep in touch with the school, obviously through through my connections, but they keep in touch with a lot of their old friends too. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I was reading your um, farewell piece in the Watsonian from 2008, and Elna Rogers uh, wrote that um, your legendary procrastination could be the stuff yeah. of nightmares. Now, <laughs> next question, I don't want you to procrastinate, no, no, I want no. you to yeah, tell, tell me you. what your one abiding memory of Watson's is. One thing stands out all your time here. Oh, well, you, if you're talking about procrastination, you know, <laughs> I'll tell you tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, okay. Oh, very good. The old no, but just specifically on that, uh -huh. specifically on that point, um, it would always be the night before projects because there was always so much to do in early May with the exams coming up, exchanges to immediately after projects, all the departmental administration and it had to be done before you went on projects. And so I have this memory of staying up until maybe three, four in the morning when it was getting light on those May mornings and getting everything, everything done, finished, and then the next morning bringing it into school, putting it in pigeonholes. That was the days before. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, before all the electronic stuff. But, and then thinking, woof, that's that done, and off on, on projects like that. But, and thinking each year, I'm not going to do that next year, I'm going to do it well in time, but never managing. So that, that's a sort of... That's a really bad memory, actually, and I, I wish I'd been able to sort that out myself. But uh, other other memories, though, abiding memories, I think projects, projects, it has to be. Uh, as I said, I loved exchanges, Munich and Paris particularly, and being with groups in those countries, meeting up with the French and German families, that was wonderful. But I think projects, getting to the top of a hill, sitting there, eating your boiled sweeties and, and, and sometimes having good weather on the top of hills. <laughs> yeah. Or bringing, once or twice when the weather was really bad, bringing groups down in bad weather and thinking, hey, this is okay. Once I got lost though. <laughs> but we found a bird and followed it all the way down. <laughs> but um, no, it, I, I, it has to be. It has to be projects. I think. Yeah. Now we're sitting here on a beautiful January day, and the sun's shining in. So, if you're just able to go anywhere in Scotland right now, where's your favourite place? Um, is it just one? No, well, you two. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, Torridon. Mm -hmm. Okay, love to go to Torridon. 
to walk into Diabeg, to climb Ben Alligan, going over the horns and then uh, round and down through the quarry. We always used to do it that way. Um, ben Damp and Torrent. Oh, no, all these places in Torrent, so many. And the other one would be Harris, the, um, the s south of Harris, the beaches of Harris. Yeah. Um, Sheila Bost, Horriger Bost, all of these places there. Yeah. I d d d just. And the quality of light in Harris, because even if it was grey, it was a sort of luminous grey always. Mm. Um, and so, yes, th those would be those two places. Yeah. 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 So I guess you've given a lot of pupils the opportunity to see these places, to experience mm. that. And that's one of the really good things about Watson's, yeah, as well yeah. as the education yeah. that is, that's provided over the time. So looking back then, and, and your your course, your change of direction from perhaps journalism to yeah. teaching, from Huntingdonshire to West Calder. Do you have any regrets? N no. That's a very short no. answer. Uh, no, there's never... Sometimes when, when I see a, a good piece of... a good article in the newspaper or someone being asking questions on TV, you know, I think, hey, I could have done that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think I almost at one point thought of doing law, and I think I might have been a reasonable lawyer, say, you know, in, in court, an advocate. I might, but then I think, no, no, none of that's got anything at all remotely as satisfying as teaching, because you know you make a difference to these kids. I mean, that sounds very selfish, I know, but they make a difference to me as well. And over the years, um, you know, especially at Watson's where you get to know a certain sort of kid. And if there have been so many who have been slightly difficult adolescents, n never any complete nightmares, but, you know, just thinking, slightly annoying. And they turn into such good people later on and you see them, you meet in the street or at Murrayfield or... In fact, uh, you know, you meet Watsonians from literally from cradle to grave. Because when my younger son was born, the midwife was a former pupil. <laughs> and, and then, of course, every time you, you go up to Morton Hall with the Purvis lot, <laughs> you know, they're all former pupils, so it takes in the whole of life. But um, when you meet these, these kids who have maybe been a bit difficult at school and they look just so well settled in life and, and happy and balanced and so on, that I used to think in, you know, in my last years of teaching, if you had a difficult kid in adolescence, you'd think, I, I'm not going to worry about that. They're going to turn out fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'd say that at parents' evening sometimes, but the parents said, you just don't know what they're like at home. <laughs> and so, But they all do turn out fine. Now, I have this faith that these kids will turn out well. And it's wonderful, too, when they're at school, because they can be anything. They're just themselves. Uh, later on they become uh, doctors or accountants or businessmen or whatever but for th this privileged moment they, they've got all the possibilities in front of them, they're just themselves and to see that flourishing and developing, uh, oh, I wouldn't have missed that for the world. Great, great. Rod, I think we're going to have to do another interview at some point because I'm sure your involvement with Watson's has not ended <laughs> and I'm sure there's still going to be an, many more pupils who are grateful to your help both in school and outside school but uh, um, if we're asking you to do a postscript to this interview now <laughs> what, what, would, what would you say what have we not covered or anything you want to oh, add no 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 I mean I've written down a, a list of things and I think we've covered them covered them all mm -hmm. um, I don't it's been we've had some wonderful colleagues and um, that's that's been another mm -hmm great thing to see the to work in a team of people who are like-minded and who are as committed as I have ever been and to see that we're all working for the kids and that we all enjoy that that's that's maybe that's the best thing about Watson's mm -hmm. yes <laughs> not standing on top of a cold hill in Torridon <laughs> no all of that right. yeah
Oh, Rod, thank you, Raj, and thank you for your okay. friendship as a, as a colleague over the years and okay. uh, for introducing me to projects. Yeah, yeah. The first one, wasn't first it? In 1993. Three. Three. Harris. Yeah, Harris, that's right. Kyle's Stockenish with no hot water. That's right. Mm. And the no hot water, no showers. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and, but of course, if you were camping, there would be maybe no showers, you know, and so on. So at the time, it didn't seem very much. But nowadays, if you, I don't think a project would go if there were no showers there. Well, we're all too soft now. I know, yeah. yeah in, so. in the last centre I was at in, um, in Harris, um, hardship was when the dishwasher broke down. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> things had changed. Yeah. Now, Rod, you've obviously been involved in a lot of things out with the classroom, and uh, particular drama. Can you tell us a wee bit about what your involvement was and how you get involved in it in the first place? Yes. Well, I used to do a little bit of drama at West Calder High before I came here. Um, and then when I first arrived, uh, Donny Fife, the English teacher, uh, got me involved in what was called middle school drama at that time um, with... S2 and S3 putting on a play along with some senior pupils. But then I started to do the main school play, uh, which was always in February at that time. Prelims were uh, before Christmas, so we'd, uh, we, could do, uh, we could rehearse in January and February and get that out of the way before the real exam started. So over the, over the piece I did about seven plays, I think. Um, uh, the, the Caucasian Chalk Circle and The Good Woman of Setsuan um, by Brecht and then The Government Inspector by Gogol. So that, these are big European things. Um, Our Town and the Grapes of Wrath, so, so some American stuff as well. And then The Chivy at the Stag and the Black Black Oil, which I which I think was one of the, the plays that I liked the best, but I think possibly it was Oh What a Lovely War because of the, the subject and it was very, very moving and to see these kids acting out the roles of the soldiers and back, you know, in the First World War they would have been, they were these soldiers, you know, maybe a year ahead of the age they were there. And many of the names in the programme that we drew up, many of the names of the cast are replicated out in the, in the war memorial too. So that, mm -hmm. that was quite, quite moving. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I did, uh, I stopped doing the main, uh, the main productions because of overcommitment really. And also because at that time the, the, the drama department were, were being developed and they t took over and the English department too. Did, did a lot more plays and the musicals. During that time when I was doing these big plays, it tended to be that David Hughes and the music department would do the musical in the summer and I'd do the play in, the, in February. But when I withdrew from that, I still carried on doing French plays. Uh, I think I, maybe over the, over the period I did 20 or 25 French plays in all, from S1 to S6 sometimes using original texts, sometimes adapting them, sometimes writing our own stuff and so on, and always putting them on in the French Institute drama competition <laughs> where we had generally quite, quite good success. One year we got into trouble at the French Institute because some boys had wanted to do a sketch about the Tour de France and they wanted the commentary in French and so on, but they had two people on exercise bikes and they were talking about how hard it was and so we saw them struggling up the hill and then they said and sometimes it was windy and someone came on with a hair dryer and blew their hair off to the side and then and then they said and sometimes it even snowed and people came on with flour and poured it all of them and then of course there was the rain and so they came <laughs> on with a bucket but the combination of water and flour on the instant on the floor of the institute with this lovely carpet because it was their reception room and so on. We got into trouble with, with that and so we had to tone down everything. Yeah. But, but we had some good times there and then even after I retired, I, the primary school, um, Madame Roger, uh, Madeleine, 
invited me in for two or three years to do uh, primary French plays there. So I, I continued to do that yeah. over the time and, and re really enjoyed that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a really good link for the next question because obviously your pupils there be speaking French and that would stand them in good stead for the exchanges. Yes. And these were big parts of the curriculum, weren't they? And yes, I, I've, I've mentioned them before, but we, we did... Uh, there was at one point we had six uh, six language exchanges going on. So not just French. No, no. There were there were o o over time there was obviously the the, the Paris exchange with the Lycée Henri IV that started in the same it yes it started life in the same year as I started life, which was 1947. Um, but the, the, so the Lycée Henri IV, and then there was uh, Munich. And other other uh, other places in France, Tonon and the Ile de Ré for S2, then Pessac S2 and La Rochelle for S6. So we had a lot of exchanges, and people often speak um, very fondly about their experience, and have kept in touch with their families over, over the years. We've discovered that, and we we ourselves, my, myself and colleagues, have stayed in very close touch with the colleagues of these exchanges. Mm -hmm. We go and stay with them, they come back here, and so on. Um, we had, there was an exchange with Moscow for a while, run by um, Elizabeth White, even with, with Italy, with a place Sondrio in the Alps, and then in Spain with Fuengirola. And I, I think many of these exchanges have died out now, but I think they're slowly trying to revive them with different places mm. and so on. How important do you think these exchanges are in developing language skills? Um, it's a, I think it was essential because the, people were arriving in families where um, they, it wasn't a controlled environment in the classroom and they just had to get by somehow mm. and, and, and speak. So they learned that you could you'd have to improvise a bit or even use a bit of English or incorrect language grammatically but you got the message through and mm -hmm. as I used to say you know do speak because bad French is better than no French <laughs> or oh, oh, mm -hmm. like that so um, and it gave people a sort of confidence I think yeah it, um, it, it wasn't always very controlled. Some people didn't really cope with with that challenge, but m many did. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, Rod, as you look back over thirty years of your attachment to Watson's and various connections, and uh, look forward to many more years of being connected through all the things you've talked about, what? How would you sum it up? What sort of conclusions would you come to? Um. Well. Just before we come on to that, when we're talking about the French things, we used to do French speaking weekends where we take the sixth oh, yeah, yes. we take, we yes. take the sixth yeah. year away for um, a whole weekend and, and, and go to Glen Isla, mm -hmm. in which this, the only rule was no English. You know, so we, we managed 48 hours mm -hmm. just speaking French. And we'd have uh, uh, assistants from various schools around the place, maybe about 10, 12 assistants. And, 15 of our kids and some staff. And what's the French for away. watch out, there's a mouse? Oh, oui. Attention, il y a une souris. <laughs> yes. I remember and, uh, Anne Allen, our colleague Anne Allen, at that point would jump on a table because she was <laughs> terrified of mice. And the, the, the staff came along and there were great occasions. And we used to have French speaking days as well, linked with other schools with uh, Barramuir and Fair Hill and St George's and have a day where the sixth year would concentrate on one of their one of the subjects that was on the syllabus, the environment for example. And at one point we had Robin Harper, the, the leader of the Scottish Greens, yeah. who came along for a question and answer session in French, you know, from our kids and he was very impressive. Yeah. So we all all those things um, we used to do French speaking evenings and However, um, you asked a, a question about overall. Um, I think it's been a huge privilege, you know, when I look back, and I think how lucky I have been to have had the opportunity to work with colleagues, I've mentioned already, with pupils like, like, as they are, 
who have been so responsive and so good and who, even if they don't all directly stay in touch, I am directly in touch with quite a number, but, but when they see you in the street, you know, they're, they're very friendly and talk about the past. Hey, remember when we were on projects together or remember when we were in Harris and things like this? Um, and to meet them all the time and to see what they've become and to think that maybe I and our colleagues have had a role in shaping them a little, I hope so anyway, mm. that that's been a, an enormous privilege. I wouldn't have had it any other way. And just finally though, you know, I would like to pay tribute. We've done all these activities, you know, myself, yourself, all our colleagues. We've been away <laughs> gadding around <laughs> up hills across, uh, across the seas and everything like that. But we have to pay tribute to our families who supported us um, every year, all the time that we were away and they were at home. And um, I'm not saying they were struggling a bit at home, maybe they're glad to see, the, see us go, but, but they did support us. All hugely. Yeah. I remember, for example, I know the dates of projects changed slightly, but at the very beginning, projects were a week earlier, and that was your daughter's birthday. Indeed, it was, yes. And if projects hadn't changed over the years, you would have never had, mm -hmm. you would have never been home for your daughter's birthday. Mm -hmm. And I always think of that. Yeah. 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 No, so there we are. All in all, a huge privilege. I'm very, very happy to have worked here. Yeah. And Rod, it's been a privilege chatting to you. I suspect we're going to see you around Collington Road for a good few years yet, and we wish you well whatever role you take in the school. Okay. okay. Thanks very much. Thank you, Graham. Thank you.